evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. <coughs> Sorry for coughing in the ears of those people who are streaming on the internet. Right, so thank you for joining me for this talk about Arvod or Arvod, depending on the spelling, but we'll go with the common spelling of Arvod. The last king of the Isle of Wight and the last pagan king in Britain. So this talk is going to be a little bit of a mixture of what we know and a bit of speculation, speculative stuff. Um, so just be prepared. I will uh, let you know when things are moving into speculative territory. Um, we'll start off basically. So where are we going? <clears throat> so we're going to start off with what we actually know. I was worried you. There's a test at the end. <laughs> we'll talk about the the Germanic kingdoms of Britain. We're going to talk about the timeline that led up to the very last battle. We're going to have a, a crack at where we think the battle might have happened. Then we're moving to a dramatic retelling of the actual battle itself. And then the aftermath, what it actually meant, what happened, what it meant for the country, what it meant for the Isle of Wight. So that's basically, uh, the itinerary for click to add title. Should I put title in there? I? <laughs> so I thought it was called click. That is, yeah, click to add title. That is, that's, that's what kids call it these days. So let's start out. What do we know? <laughs> Nothing. And I say that because we have zero primary sources. Zero primary sources. What we have is Bedda, or as you probably know him as Bede, the Venerable Bede, Bedda, as he would have been known. That's kind of our only source. We also have the Anglo Saxon Chronicle, um, which kind of glosses over it. Sorry if I keep looking at my screen, so I need to see if anyone's turned up. But, uh, Let's, let's see what actually Bede actually had to say, or Bede uh, had to say about this. So this is what he actually said. He said, after Kadvala, so Kadvala being the king of Wessex, or the Grisi, obtained possession of the kingdom of the Grisi, he took also the Isle of Wight, which till then was entirely given over to idolatry and by merciless slaughter, endeavored to destroy all the inhabitants thereof and to place in their stead people of his own province, binding himself by a vow, though it is said that he was not yet baptized in Christ, to give the fourth part of the land and to give forth of the land and the soil to his lord, i.e. to the bishop, Wilfred, uh, who happened at the time to have come thither of his own people. So basically what he did, that's, that's kind of all we have. There's a little bit more, a little bit further down, where it talks about the, um, what they call the first fruits. So he calls them the two royal boys, Speculation to being whether they're brothers or sons. Some, uh, I like to think that they're his sons. It says, um, here I think it ought to not be omitted that as the first fruits of those who that the island who believe, believe were saved, two royal boys, brothers to Arvold, king of the island. And that's our first mention of Arvold there were crowned with 
the special grace of God. For when the enemy approached, they made their escape out of the island and crossed over unto a neighboring province of the Jews, coming to the place called At the Stone. They thought to be concealed. And then it goes on to talk about a priest who baptized them and cut, and then uh, they were betrayed. And Kedvala um, took it upon himself to slay them, which made perfect sense to him because uh, he didn't want any of the royal line left, anyone that could challenge his, um, basically, his, his, his dominance of uh, the Isle of Wight. So not a lot really, right? Not much that we know. But from those little bits of information, we can glean other bits because we know what happened. We have a fair idea of the fights that went on. The, we, uh, we know that that time was very war prone, that all the, the Germanic tribes, the Germanic kingdoms were fighting amongst themselves. You had the Angles, you had the Jutes, you had the Saxons. They weren't one homogenous group of people. Like you know, the term Anglo-Saxon, really, they didn't like each other at all. And in fact, although they spoke root language, there was dialect and in some cases, complete uh, differences in languages. So, let's talk a little bit about the kings. So this is just a, uh, a condensed down map of the uh, Germanic tribes. It did go further off down here, but uh, for when we're talking, this is, this is the end of the map. So the Vidvara, and that's how they would have pronounced it, W would be of the sound. Vidvara, the Isle of Wight. We had the Mianvara, which was another Jutish kingdom, and the Kantavara, Kent, well, which is now Kent, which again was a, a, a Jutish kingdom. So if we just think about the invasion or the 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 Germanic tribes as they came in. So they came in through, came in from Germany down here and into Kent and also down along here. So the Jutes were the first that came in, then the Saxons and then the Angles. And so the Angles were up here and they sort of came down, the Saxons came down and came through. So everyone's heard of uh, Hengist and Horsa, the fabled first kings, they were Jews. We have Wese or Wessex. Everyone knows about Wessex. Sudsexi, the South Saxons, Sussex. Here was the Mudre or the middle, and that was kind of a melding of the Saxons and the Jutes, which ended up becoming Middlesex, the, the Mudre Sexy. Okay. So these are the kingdoms that we're talking about. And Kedvala, Kedvala, who was the warlord who was uh, hell bent on becoming the Bretvelda, the leader of Britain, the king of all Britain, came from Wessex. He, he had been thrown out and set in, put into exile, but uh, he teamed up with Wilfred, who we spoke about earlier, um, 
and uh, he promised to convert to Christianity and uh, would basically make sure that uh, the, the church was well funded if the church funded him in his crusade. So a little bit of a side note, who thinks they know who the patron saint of the Isle of Wight? Any ideas? Nope. Nope. Any ideas? A lot of people seem to think that um, uh, it might be, I think, someone to do with Ventnor, Brown Ventnor. But yeah, not, yeah. A lot of people think it's Boniface. But it's not. It's actually Wilfred, the guy that financed the slaughter of every, of every nobleman on the Isle of Wight, is the patron saint of the Isle of Wight. And in actual fact, there wasn't a single church that was dedicated to Wilfred on the island until very recently, the Catholic Church created one in Britain. So that's how much they like. <laughs> Sorry? That's not Mary Moore, is it? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, only... Oh, yes, it did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, they still still operate. Yeah. So we're now going to start moving into the speculative part of this. Because anything that I tell you now, I have, we have a few dates but we don't have a lot. So anything I tell you now is really going to be speculative. I don't know how much you're going to be able to see this, but this is basically a timeline from the first kings of the Isle of Wight. We will zoom in a little bit, but I don't expect you to be able to say right through to the death of Arvod. Starting here, Right through. Now we don't know really what happened in this period here. We know that we have two kings. And um, uh, they were probably brothers. We know when they were crowned, but we don't know what happened after that. And there's not, not a lot going on, being that either the Isle of Wight was just basically a self-contained kingdom that kept to itself or was a subjugated kingdom and uh, paid, it would pay tribute to one of the bigger kingdoms and um, was basically left alone. So if we zoom in a little bit more, Again, the, the quality is not great on this. this video. We can. So now we're, we're, we're coming into, again, as I said, sort of speculative territory. I put this line here as where I kind of assume Arvold was born around about 650, perhaps, just. Speculating, and the reason that I kind of picked that date was because just after um, uh, around about here, uh, the the Catholic Church sent their first, um, uh, I guess, missionaries to the Isle of Wight to convert everyone. And I think Ardival would have been in his early teens at this point, and he would have seen what would have happened. Now, there's no indication that this was a violent invasion. It seems that they came along, they built a church, they preached a little bit, convert, converted in inverted commas, but there's an interesting thing that happened around this time. 
the king of Kent converted as well. He was Jewish. He converted to Christianity. And here's what we also know. Egbert, the next king, yeah, was married to the sister of Arvor. So obviously, the line, Arvor's line, was considered a proper royal line, or there was no way that they could be married. Right? We know that when Egbert became king, his mother was regent, so he must have been quite young. We also know when two of his sons were born, and one of them was called Vitbred. Vitbred. Okay. Name derived from the Isle of Wight. So one of the sons was, was named Vitbred. We know that Egbert was quite young. We know that uh, more than likely, Arvold's sister would have been quite young. So the timelines kind of match up. So my thinking is, and this is per purely speculative, anyone that tells you they know the actual facts and know the actual story, you're either kidding themselves or kidding you. So unless they preface it with speculation, I'd be questioned. My, my speculation is that they did convert the Isle of Wight, or they thought they did. And they said, look, they said to whoever the king was at that time, Arvold's father, they said, look, your cousin over there in Pantavara, he's converted, and he's got a son. Why don't you solidify what you've done and give us your portrait? To take? The timelines kind of match up. So I'm thinking that she was around about 12 when she married, 12, 13, maybe. That's kind of about the age, which also lines up. So she would have been about 14, 15 when she had her first child, 16 when she had a second. She also had a daughter. Now, we don't know when she died, but I'm assuming, you know, just judging by the life expectancy, I suspect. When her husband died, she was then shipped off to a nunnery somewhere. Her mother-in-law, this brown line here, we know when she died. She died up here. Chances are, Arvold's sister, if she is here, blue line in the middle, maybe she went to the same nunnery. It's fun to think about, right? Let's zoom in a little bit. From, right. Now we're getting into the, uh, the last few years of Arnold, the rise to power of Kedvala. So here's the rise to power of Kedvala. Okay. That's his reign there. He actually didn't reign for very long. In actual fact, he was forced to abdicate. We will get onto that. He wasn't a very nice, liked person. And right here, right in the middle, is where we know where I died. Keep an eye on the time. Let's move a little bit. Where did it happen? We don't know. I've got lots of questions, but I don't have any answers. But I can tell you, I can, I've can. i got a pretty good idea where it might have happened. <coughs> so let's go back up here to, uh, to our uh, map here. 
Gedvala swept across here. He and his brother Mull lay waste to Kadvala. And, in, and uh, Kadvala installed Mull as the king of Kadvala. Kadvala left. The Jews didn't like him. So, do you know what they did? They burnt him alive in a barn. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> he didn't reign for very long. Um, But anyway, so we have Kedvala comes down here and he took, takes the Sufis. Now at this point, he has two choices. He can go into the Minovara, a very hostile area. He's just had a fairly big fight here against the Jutes. When he came into the Sussex, it were Saxons. And it might have been a little bit easier for him. So he has a choice here. Does he go into the Minavada or does he go to the Midbar? Well, we know because Bedda tells us. Bedda tells us that he came down to, and the Anglo Saxon chronicles tell us as well, came down from the Sussexi and came across to the Vidvara. So, what does that mean? East Coast has to come to. Go and have a look at our map. So we can assume that somewhere along here, right? Certainly wouldn't have come around sand down or lake. Number one, you've got the cliffs, and that's not really great for an invasion invading force because you're going to have all your enemies up on the cliffs throwing rocks and spears and Arrows at you. You're probably not going to come up here because this at the time was all um, was all forested. Again, kind of not really great because your enemies are going to be basically real force. So where are you going to come? Around here, or maybe even into here. I think we probably came around here, the beaches around here, because it's flat. <coughs> it was easy to get to the rest of the island from there if you needed to. It was open. There are a few sort of ancient groves and things around there, but it was fairly, fairly flat, easy trip. You also had uh, Wolverton here which no longer exists, but that was a very prosperous uh, city. And from here, you could quite easily get across the downs into what was then the capital of the, the island, what we now call Carisbury. Okay, Newport probably didn't exist at this point. So Newport was created because the river that came up through Carisbrook silted up. So they shifted everything down. So we're going to assume around here's what we might have come over. So our main characters, who have we got here? We've got Arvold, our champion, our hero. The Vidvalda, the ruler of the Vid. Sister, the queen of Kent, not Ken. Who wrote this? <laughs> two sons or two brothers, I like to say two sons. The last pagan king in Britain, and he was killed defending his country. This way. We have Kadvala on the other side, king of Wessex. Technically still pagan. He's, he's fighting under the Christian banner. Okay. I like to think they called him the heretic king at this point. He promised a third or a quarter, depending on 
So Anglo-Saxon Chronicles say a third. Bed this as a quarter of the island to the church. He converted to Christianity, but he was forced to be abdicated in disgrace. Then we'll talk about how he died. So the final battle. If anyone needs to use the loo, now it's time. No? The crashing of blades rang out like shrill echoes through the now chilled afternoon air. The clash of axes against shields and the shattering of timber was like a disjointed drumbeat that thumped over and over. And all the while, there were the screams of the wounded writhing in pain as the beach ran crimson with blood. The last pagan king, the great Vidvalda, protector of the Ilfe kind, the son of Vodin himself, Arvold, looked up from his bloody battlefield. The king turned to his most trusted, beloved thane, Irsvipa. The time is now. We are softening. Everyone. This is the moment we must seize. I call upon my brother to to guide my final battle blow against this godless traitor who pollutes our land. Peter Stepper readied his sword, looked at his king and declared, to the death, Vidbara. No, replied our lord. You have a greater duty. You must at all costs secure our line. If anything happens to me, you must take the boys, our kin to the Miyamara. They're waiting. From where you must take them to my sister in the Kantavara. Now, swear it. He grabbed his arm of his friend and whispered, swear it. Nodding his head, he had stepped for great. Arvod looked up to his friend. His battle-hardened face was fierce and fierce and worthy. And at that moment, he knew his friend would do his duty. Now go. You must lead the men while I fight. The two warrior brothers nodded, grunted, and bashed their shields together. They turned without another word and left each other one final time. The Vidvalda scanned the carnage about him. In his current state of hyper-awareness, everything moved in a slow motion. His keen eyes scanned the beach until he finally saw what he was looking for. He gripped his sword, spat angrily in the ground, and ran with every drop of strength he had left. His men were falling one by one to the superior numbers of the heretic's army, and our world knew it. He had seen all the signs, and in his heart of hearts, he knew the demigoddess, the Virkreich, was near and had his orders. She would take someone to Vodun's great hall tonight. The Wittwalder's heart pounded. The blood rushed through his ears. All he could think of was, at that very moment, was that the land, and to land, a final killing blow on his opponent. He ran with swiftness of a man half his age. He was sidestepping people and bodies, weaving this way and that, fighting off flailing blows of swords and axes. Arvold made his way to the group of heavily armored men that surrounded the great heretic, Advala. These were his house cards, the bodyguards of the heretic an impenetrable line that surrounded their Lord and not one that could easily be broken. However, on this day, as Arvold approached, the house cars heard that Lord bark at the man. Let the Vitvada through. Arvold battered, <coughs> bruised, blood, some of his and some of the slain, dripped down his arms, his face painted white and blue from the sacred pigments of the island stopped, clutched the hilt of his sword, and stood his ground, 
silently as his eyes burnt holes through Agbala. The two men looked at each other, their eyes burning. And in that moment, all sights and sounds fell away. It was only them. With a curled lip and a look of disdain on the heretic's face, he shouted, I give you a choice, King of the Vidvalda. Lay down your sword, forfeit this place, and bow before me. If you do this, I will spare what is left of your men. I will never. You are not worthy to stand on this sacred ground. You who swear no allegiance to anything but your own stinking power, replied Arthur as he spat to the ground. For a moment, Arthur said nothing. This pointed all around him, laughing at the death he had wrought against the father. Then, with hatred not a contempt, he raised his sword. So be it! The two men ran at each other with speed and agility that could only be fueled by the conviction of bile. Swinging their swords with as much, much force as either had and it was able to muster. Their blows were so hard that it knocked each one backwards, their balance hindered by the sand beneath their feet. Arvold was the first to set to first up and charged again, using his shoulder behind his shield to crash directly into Kadvala like some sort of human battering ram, and the heretic fell back some more. Kadvala stood, but without any without the center of gravity, he couldn't center himself. Arvold came at him again, this time jumping at his body and knocked him off his feet. By hiding behind his house cart, the majority of the battle, Kadvala had the advantage. He was able to move a little more swiftly, even on all fours. He grabbed his sword and seized the opportunity to edge further down the beach, where the sand was damp and more compact. Arvold came in at once, at once more, and this time, he had his sword raised high, ready for the death blow, but Kavala had seen it coming. And now, on more solid ground, was able to pull himself up and thrust his sword deep into the belly of the Vidvada. The king of the Vidvada stopped mid-lunge and looked down at Kavala, who was now getting up off the ground. A searing pain filled Arvold's body and the hot blood that welled up through his throat and flowed out of his mouth. He knew these were his last moments. He felt his life draining from him as he tried to lift his sword for one last time. Advala moved in close, grabbed the hair of Arvold and whispered in his ear, I would have had you killed anyway. At least this way, I get to do it myself as if I dream of all the Jewish eyes. Arvold caught blood spilling out of his lips, but was able to raise a smile and he croaked, You are cursed, Kadvala. From this day forth, you are not a whole man, and the blood my sword now tastes will be like venom in your blood. And with one final act, he pushed his sword into the side of Kadvala. Both men slumped to the ground with a great silence, and a great silence fell over the Kadvala. Irsta rushed to the side of his king and dragged him to the beach as Kadvala's men dragged their lord away. Great black clouds gathered above the island, the, the, the first cracks of light were ripped overhead, and powerful throngs of thunder filled the ears. Yeah, the ears. Arvold's men cried out as one. Well. The Vitvalde is dead. They surrounded the body of the now fallen king and held their swords and shields of formation. Protect the son of Vodan at all costs, shouted the US deputy. In formation, ready themselves. In moments like these, a single drop could feel like it takes an eternity to form. Time had stopped around them and they all waited for the heavens to open. All was still except the 
rumbling of Gunor in the distance. The other place was near. The shades and spectres of the dead hung thick in the air. And at that moment, they all knew that silence, that moment that reigned supreme. And then it started. A few drops of rain hit the ground. Each drop was cold and heavy, and each drop stung the weary survivors. Yet none said a word, just waited. Kedvala lives! Praise the Lord Almighty! Kedvala lives! was the cry from the house cards. Arvok's men stood their ground, ready to do their duty. Then, through the beating rain, a feeble, feeble voice of Kedvala called, Let them go. Let the remaining Vidvara go and bury their king. Kedvala and his men watched as the last Vidvara army picked up Arvold and took him silently into the heart of the island. Not a word was spoken, no one looked back. The night was upon them. The night was upon them all. None of Kedvala men wanted to stay in that place. The tide was coming in. One by one, the bodies were dragged out to sea. Crimson stain marks of bloody passage. Battlefield. The bodies begin to drag and melt. It seemed like they were moving by some unseen hand. Even though the army of Katvala marched under the cross, beliefs in the old ways still run deep. Every man knew that tonight Ilan would be coming to take the dead away. They knew that it was no longer a place for living. For if you sleep amongst the shades of the dead, death herself may mistake you for a bird. Deep within the wooded canopy of wit, Arvold had been laid on a bed of timber. And although Kadvala had let them take the king, no man trusted the heretic, so they moved swiftly. They say the old gods cried out in pain that night. That they had met their match with new. For the people of the island believed that the magic that all beings need, godlike or not, <laughs> was lessened that day. Finally, the reckoning was upon them, the great Grita, the time to settle accounts, where the old would be swept away and chaos would reign supreme. And the old gods finally took their leave and went to sleep under the great dragon of the island. The Ildwitter, the Archmagus, wore, with his ill-fitting robes and great staff, made of hazel arrive. He was an old man now, but still cut an imposing figure. As he walked down the ancient path, he caught sight of the Ostipper and nodded. Both men knew what was to be done. The rites, the rites must be performed, shouted the old man as his body of the king lay crumpled on the timber. He turned to the women folk, called for them to clean the body and clothe. Lastly, he turned to speak to the fox king himself, the magical protector of the island, whose soul filled the woodlands in this holy place. With his arms held high, his staff in one hand and sword in, in the and sword in the other, he called out into the night, Fox King, I implore thee, guide the spirit of our king, son of Voldin, Vitvalda, to the new life of glory. Guide him upon the wings of the ravens. Guide him so you have guided him before. Swiftly now, before the enemies of our world come upon us. The Ildvita anointed the king and kissed his life side on his cheeks and turned to our old wife and sons. He knelt down to the children's level and spoke softly. You are the kings now. You hold the heart of the sacred island in your hands. Its blood courses through your veins. You must be brave. For now you must leave your mother and be men. But it won't always be this way. You will not be alone. Your stepper will take you. He will protect you as if you were his sons. Your stepper walked forward, took the hand of the queen, and kissed him, said, 
my lady. I have sworn to protect the wings and I will do my duty. Tonight I will take them through the Minavada and then to your sister-in-law's court. The curse upon me to wander the lands alone if I fail. He felt like he was stealing them from his mother's arms. This woman who had known them from the day they were born. This woman who was as a sister to me. He looked into her eyes. He felt Arthur. He knew in her face of all things. She must stand tall and strong until we find each other again. The queen spoke to the Athelings quietly and quietly. She placed blessings on their foreheads. She kissed them one last time. She prayed to the goddess Fish to look after them. She prayed that they would find their way home one day soon. Final farewell. He had a step to the children into the land. The boys never made it to their aunt. They were betrayed mere days after landing on the Mirabella. Kadvala somehow had known where the children were and intercepted them, had them slaughtered ensure the house of Brit was established. Not satisfied with killing Arvold and his sons, Kadvala sent his men after the rest of the noble houses of Bitvara and committed what can only be called genocide, wiping out all, all but the peasantry. It was a bloodthirsty act that was born out of cruelty more than anything else. In the end, though, Kadvala succumbed to his injuries. It was said that he never fully recovered from the wounds inflicted by Arvold, and in the end spent the rest of his days a sick man, a half dead, and died of a blood cancer. So that actually happened, the last bit. Advala did die of the, uh, of the wounds that Arvold inflicted. So we're back in the world of the aftermath, what this actually means, what actually happened. The last pagan kingdom was now Christianized. Probably the peasantry didn't convert. It would have taken them a long time. And when they did, they probably hung on to those old traditions very, very long. You can see that in parts of the churches, the parts that haven't been destroyed by the Victorians. But what about the royal line? Out of old sister, three children that we know of. Idric, Bitterhead, Emmeline. Emmeline was daughter, and uh, she went off to be the matriarch of some very important um, bloodlines. Idric died early, although he was co king with Bitterhead. Bitterhead went on to have three children Athelbert II, Edbert I and Eirik, and through that line, we ended up with Alfred the Great. So Arvold's sister, the royal line of the Isle of Wight, is the royal line that comes right through to the house of people today. Arvold's sister, the matriarch of our entire, our entire So one good thing. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. <clears throat> no? What did you say about Wolverton? Wolverton, yes. Uh, so Wolverton was uh, one of the largest towns in the island. And it was uh, where? Wolverton was about three. 
No, 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 St. Helens is over here. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, so yeah, Wolverton. So, um, uh, you know, Centurion's Cops. Yes, that's why I wanted Yeah, so Centurion's Cops, people think it's named after the Romans, named after St. Urien, enigmatic saint that didn't exist. That we know of, possibly a derivation of um, St. Uriel, perhaps the Archangel. Who knows? Um, uh, yeah, so um, the Church of, that, that's an, another story which I'll probably go through in, a, in another storytelling event. Where we'll talk yeah, so Wolverton was a very, very powerful town, very rich. Um, back then, this part here was an actual island, it was its own island. So he came in through the, the haven here, uh, Brady Haven. And it actually flowed out where you know where the um, uh, where the dinosaur the dinosaur park is where it all drops down there that's where it all flowed out so that was that was the um, that was kind of the delta there and um, the uh, eastern yard would flow out both areas and the same here with the western yard this was its own island as well. And uh, Yarmouth, also. I can't remember. Does that answer the, <laughs> answer the question? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, they would have. They would have worshipped the um, the Germanic pantheon, uh, Voden, Tu, uh, Dunor, Frigg. Uh, Ingo Freya, Freya. Um, so that's how we got the days of the week. Monday, Monday, day. Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Golden's Day, Thursday, Do North Day, Friday, Bridge Day. They didn't have a word for Saturday. So it could have been, Saturday could have been actually called Bifre uh, Sunday, before the sun's day. Or it could be called the day of washing, because that's kind of what, if, if we extrapolate from the northern, um, so, yeah. So yeah, they, they, they would have worshiped that pantheon. Did they have seven days? Yeah, uh, yeah, they did. Uh, the what the names of the gods? Uh, uh, Germanic, the Germanic, they were the Germanic names of these gods. So <coughs> they're somewhat cognate to the uh, Norse gods. So Voden is cognate of Odin. Um, uh, Thunor is cognate of uh, of Thor. Um, uh, so uh, Luke is Loki. Uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of sort of crossover. Uh, we know a lot uh, from archaeology, and um, so so there is, there is we we can go back to uh, Iron Age, um, pre you know pre Celtic. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence. Well, you know, a lot of the uh, burial mounds are actually pre Celtic. Uh, you know the the 
there is no such thing as an indigenous Britain. You know, that, that's an absolute fallacy. And in actual fact, if you went back to the first inhabitants, you know, they were uh, dark skinned, dark hair, dark skin, dark eyed um, people. Um, so, you know, there's no such thing as a indigenous. Thing. But yeah, we can go back quite, quite a bit. That the fine detail, the actual fine detail, it was not, it was not um, seen as a, you know, a, a very important place. <clears throat> you know, it was it was a, a little island that sort of hung off. In fact, the Romans who were meticulous really didn't keep much. When they laid marble, mm -hmm. you know roughly where that was. Kind of. We 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 kind of think maybe we know. Um, it's around uh, five barrows way. Is is the assumption? Uh, not that way. More towards. Um, uh, fresh water. Yeah. There is a um, there is a burial mound that was found that had a, a high stake sword in it, and the body had been burned, which was a very unusual thing to do. And they would do that in the cases of they didn't want that. Person to be extinct. And I like to think maybe that was our role to keep in here safe. We don't know. But kind of, there's, there's, there is one place um, that a few of my, me and my folkloric friends kind of designated where we think it might be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, braiding was also quite important. Um, braiding was probably the mother church of the island. And that's another reason why I think possibly that is where the invasion would have happened. Because it was probably that's where the first um, uh, Christian missionaries came in. So that was probably. The, the, the mother church of the island. Um, that's possibly where they um, uh, came in and they, they, because it's just a good, just a really nice launching pad. Yeah. Um, the, the reason that Wolverton was, was more prosperous was because it had a natural um, pier that sort of came out and the the water basically came up the banks of the town, and uh, and later on they had um, a a very famous um, holy well there, and and they say that you know the water would never spoil, so a lot of sailors would come and fill their um, barrels there, so Wolverton made a lot of money out. Pilgrimages, things like that. But yeah, so that was very, very, um, very important place. And of course, they also have stories, of, a, a lot of stories around that area of giants and all sorts of people coming from that area as well. We have, and on on breaking down, we also have there's a few um, burial mounds that were up there that sort of looked out over the whole area. And that's of course why um, we have the um, the Roman villa there as well, because it was just perfect for trade. And the Isle of Wight was very, very fertile. 
um, particularly the West, it still is the most fertile part of the island. It's absolutely abundant. Any others? Other questions? Penda, yep. Zero. Fifty-four. Fifty-four, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think Penda was the last thing. And in fact, some people will even try and say that, well, uh, we'll, we'll take it. But, but Bedda, Bedda is very clear. He is king of the Vip. He's very clear. He was considered king. And if he wasn't, there's no way that his sister would have been married off to the king of Kent. It's one of the largest kingdoms in, the, uh, 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 in uh, Britain at the time. Just wouldn't have happened. It has to have been an acknowledged royal line. I think. We're in speculation. Yeah, you know, any other questions? Comments? No? My pleasure. And thank you for everyone that uh, joined me online. Um, and uh, uh, hang on. What coinage was used on the Isle of Wight? I assume Isle of Wight didn't have these own coins. We don't know what coinage was used. We don't. It was probably um, uh, the same sort of coinage that was used in uh, uh, Wessex. That, sorry, this came in from the online people. Um, it was probably the same coinage that was used on the mainland. Um, there's no evidence of any Isle of Wight minting going on. But there could have been. But the Isle of Wight doesn't have any gold or silver or anything like that. Um, so. None whatsoever. I read you all we know. <laughs> there is no description. I like to think he was probably very stocky. Um, he, I like to think that he was probably, um, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I, I like to think that he was quite, you know, bushy hair, a bit unkempt. In fact, I like to think that he was bald. Like myself, <laughs> <laughs> he could have been a giant, he could have been a giant, but um, uh, but yeah, like, I, I think he was probably, um, yeah, but I think he's probably a bit of a wild bearded guy. Yeah, someone. Yeah, someone did a, an art project a few years ago um, for uh, hidden, the Hidden Heroes Project, yeah, um, which is great. Uh, Andy, you're, you're most welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, well, any other questions? Feel free to ask anything you like. No? Anyone online have any questions? No? Right. Well, I think that's it, everyone. Thank you so Thank you much. much. Thank you very much. Glad you enjoyed it.